Greetings, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, peace be upon you all. I am very pleased to be among you today, once more in Utah, which is one of my very favorite places to visit, and of which I have very fond memories, having taught at the University of Utah for two years and having given talks twice before at BYU. Um, I'd like to first thank the LDS Church, Brigham Young University, and the organizers of this conference in the Islamic world today uh, for inviting me here today to speak, especially Professor Grant Underwood and also Professor James Toronto and my former student at the University of Chicago, Professor Kevin Blankenship. Um, I'm also honored to share this podium with distinguished colleagues and scholars from whom I've learned so much over the past two days. And thank you, Professor Ray, for your very kind introduction. Now to my presentation. So I've prepared PowerPoint slides and to give you a visual of my main points. Uh, and you're welcome to look at them as I speak or not, whichever works best for you. All Muslims have one prophet, one Quran, one Qibla. Their prophet is Muhammad, their holy book is the Quran, and their direction of ritual prayer is toward the Kaaba, the house of God in Mecca. They are united in their main beliefs and practices, but there are also significant divergences in doctrine and in practice, and these are largely rooted in the question of leadership. In this panel on diversity in Islam, I will speak about the two largest denominations of Muslims, Shia and Sunni. Other than Sunni and Shia, another approach to Islam is Sufism or Islamic mysticism. This is not a denomination per se, but an interiorizing approach to Islam, and Sufis have distinct practices of communing with God. In a uh, rather stark contrast, Salafism, a branch of Sunnism, is mostly practice-oriented. And there are many other approaches uh, to Islam. In my talk today, however, I'm going to speak only of, on the Shia and Sunni denominations. I'll focus on the early foundational period when initial differences developed with a few remarks on later periods and our present time. It's important to remember that Islam is not a monolith, and not all Muslims are the same. It's also important to remember that there are fundamental beliefs and practices that unite all Muslims. In order to understand Islam and Muslims, it's necessary to know both, the aspects all Muslims agree on and the aspects they interpret differently. This is a large topic, and I'll have to leave out many details and nuances and caveats. In the half hour at my disposal, I'll endeavor to give you a bird's eye view of the Sunni and Shia denominations, who they are, how they came about, the points they unite them, and the points that divide, that divide them. There are several essential beliefs held by all Muslims. Many of you probably know already some of these, but a concise presentation will give you a holistic picture. So first, Islam. Islam means commitment to God's will. And a Muslim is one who commits to God's will. This is the first and basic premise of being Muslim. Often the translation submission is used and I believe that's less accurate because it takes away the sense of agency and free choice inherent in the concept of Islam. The essential creed of faith for all Muslims is there's no God but God, and Muhammad is God's messenger, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah. All Muslims believe in one God who is described in the Quran with attributes such as the merciful, the powerful, the creator, the sustainer. Many conceive of these qualities uh, sorry, many conceive of these names as qualities that we must emulate. For in the world of a medieval Muslim philosopher, 
To be a true philosopher is to emulate God to the highest limit of our human capacity. God is conceived by Muslims in different ways, and I'll speak on this shortly, but all Muslims worship God and strive to attain closeness to him. All Muslims also believe that Muhammad is God's messenger, Rasulullah. They revere him as the conduit of revelation and as a model of virtue and piety. He's seen as the divinely guided guide for humanity, God's mercy for all the world, the perfect human being, and beloved friend and intercessor. His words and practice are a lofty exemplar that all Muslims emulate. Another essential belief is that the Quran is the word of God, and we have heard uh, powerful lectures on these yesterday. Uh, belief in its divine origin is shared by all Muslims. The Quran contains knowledge of all things. It's God's sign and Muhammad's miracle. Through its guidance, it transforms humans into angelic beings. This is similar in broad terms, I think, with LDS theology that teaches that humans are celestial beings in embryo. Arabic is the language of the Quran, and thus the language is also revered. Translations are considered interpretations, and only the Arabic Quran is considered the actual word of God. Uh, now, further important beliefs that all Muslims share are as follows, and they're all based in the Quran. All Muslims believe in the concept of an afterlife, the good enter paradise with the angels and the evil enter hellfire. All Muslims believe in a chain of prophets, the major prophets, each of whom brought a new law, Sharia, are Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, and the sixth major prophet, the seal of the prophets and the greatest of them all, according to Muslims, is Muhammad. All prophets are believed to convey the same essential message while their laws change based on the changing needs of the age. They also perform miracles at God's command. The Quran narrates the stories of other biblical prophets as well. David, Solomon, Jacob, Joseph, earlier Enoch, Lot, Isaac, all are considered prophets. Jesus' mother, Mary is considered most holy, and a full chapter is devoted to her in the Quran. Also, uh, next point, all Muslims believe in the concept of a divine law. Uh, all Muslims believe in resurrection, in the day of judgment, individual accountability for one's actions. All Muslims believe in a metaphorical path that leads to God, which is embodied in right belief and right action. The first chapter of the Quran invokes the prayer, guide us to the straight path. Also, all Muslims believe in the moral teachings of the Quran and the Hadith, including love for one's fellow human beings, piety, kindness, truth, and charity. And all Muslims believe in the spiritual equality of humans before God. Now, in addition to doctrines, all Muslims, or most Muslims, converge on certain points of practice. They perform or aspire to perform certain mandatory acts of worship. So practicing Muslims perform the ritual prayer five times a day, which is a series of standings and prostrations, alongside recitations from the Quran and prayers. They offer the annual alms tithe, a percentage of one's income for the benefit of the poor and needy. They fast for 30 days in the month of Ramadan, which entails dawn to dusk abstention from all food and drink, including water. This teaches compassion for the poor. They perform the pilgrimage to Mecca, to what is known as the house of God, at least once in their lives. Now these are the main points of unity, and there are more, but I'm gonna move on to the points of diversity, and I wanna first speak on sources of difference. So there are three chief sources of difference. The first one is interpretation of scripture. And you've heard about this uh, at several points during these two days. All Muslims believe in the Quran as the word of God, yes, but they interpret the Quran differently. Similarly, the interpretations of Muhammad's words uh, are different. And here, as we heard in uh, the, the talk yesterday, there's the additional question of which are historically valid. Different groups accept different hadith as authentic. Yeah. I mean, which is why, I mean, the interpretations vary so widely, which is why there can never be a united 
Islam, you, you know, Isla you cannot ever answer a question which begins with, what does Islam say about X, right? I mean, it's like asking, what does Christianity say about X, right? Well, there are many, many different positions within the various Christian traditions. What does Judaism say about X? Yes, you could quote a, a verse of scripture from the Quran, but someone with another position could say, well, this actually doesn't mean this, this means that, right? Um, so the interpretation of script, scripture is a, a, a major uh, source of differences within Muslims. Another key basis for difference is interpretation of certain historical events, especially as regards the question of rightful leadership of the Muslim community. And I'll come to that in more detail on that in a minute. Uh, yet another significant basis for difference among Muslims, and this is within denominations as well, is difference in culture. And we've seen a little bit of that also in the last two days with the Senegalese traditions, for example, uh, very colorful, very different uh, in, in some ways. Um, and difference in culture gives rise to differences in social norms. So today, for example, there are Muslims across the globe Muslims who grew up in the US and Europe speak English and are influenced in their daily lives and in their religious doctrine and practice by the culture they live in. Muslims who live in East Asia, South Asia, and the Middle East each have their own cultural norms that influence the way they live and the way they interpret the law. According to a 2010 Pew poll, the Arabic-speaking Middle East and North Africa is home only to about 20% of the world's 1.8 billion Muslims, or 1.6, right, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, even within each of these, even within each of these, uh, 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 sorry, I, and I wanted to say also that a majority, 62%, live in Indonesia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Iran, and Turkey. So within each of these regions, also within the countries of the Middle East, for example, there are many cultural differences, and it, these influence the way they practice Islam. These variances influence both religious doctrine and practice. There are different schools of law, different schools of theology, and numerous particularities in how groups of Muslims, even individual Muslims within a group, approach their religion. This has been said in many different ways over these past two days, but I think you know, you, it's important to keep making the point and to give, keep giving uh, examples of this. Percentages of Sun Sunni and Shia, and now this is coming cl closer to the main point of the talk, and various subdenominations within them, as well as, as of other smaller denominations, has varied over time. Political considerations have played a large role. Regions moved toward one denomination or another, often depending on the support of the ruling dynasty. The Umayyads and Abbasids early on, and the um Ottomans later in the central Islamic lands promoted Sunnism and the Hanafi legal school. The Safavids in 16th century Iran promoted 12 or Shiism. In this century, around 15% of all Muslims, roughly 230 million people identify as Shia, and around 85%, roughly 1.6 billion people identify as Sunni. Now to the evolution of the Sunni and Shia denominations. So the Prophet Muhammad died in 632 AD in Medina. Although the two groups of Sunni and Shia crystallized gradually over several decades, even centuries, the roots of their disagreement go back to the question of succession. According to the Shia, Muhammad appointed Ali ibn Abi Talib as his successor in a public sermon addressing thousands of Muslims at Ghadir Khum, near Makkah, after his last pilgrimage. The term Shia, by the way, means followers, and it's a shortened version of Shia Ali, or followers of Ali. According to the Sunnis, the Prophet praised Ali in the sermon, but he did not indicate succession. Ali was Muhammad's younger cousin, his ward, his son-in-law, and the first male Muslim. He is revered by both Sunni and Shia, for his fierce loyalty to the Prophet and his unparalleled valor in establishing the new religion. They narrate many sayings of the Prophet praising him. So here's one, you, Ali, are my brother in this world and the next. Another, I am the city of knowledge, 
this is Muhammad's hadith, and Ali is its gateway. Both Shia and Sunni authors narrate that Muhammad asked the Muslims at Ghadir Khum, am I not your mawla? I'll explain the key word mawla in a moment. Yeah, am I not your mawla? The Muslims replied in one voice, yes, indeed, you are our mawla. Muhammad said, for whomsoever I am mawla, henceforth, Ali is his mawla. Man kuntu mawla, fa aliyun mawla. The Shia interpret the word mawla to mean master in light of the Quranic verse, Allah is the believer's mawla. Muhammad's statement, the Shia say, is a clear indication of succession appointment. They bolster this claim with other statements and acts by the Prophet, which they interpret as further indications of succession appointment. They believe that Ali inherited Muhammad's spiritual and temporal role as divinely guided guide for the Muslim community, that he was God's choice and Muhammad's choice for this role. The Sunnis interpret the word Mawla as an adoptive member of a tribe, which means someone who is one of your own. And they say that Muhammad loved Ali and wanted to offer him protection against any who may wish him harm since Ali had been at the forefront of Muhammad's early battles and the relatives of the pagan Arabians he had killed may have wanted to take revenge. So Sunni say Muhammad said this in order to protect Ali. According to the Sunnis, Muhammad died without appointing an heir. And the Muslims in Medina chose Abu Bakr to lead the Muslim community. Abu Bakr was a close companion of the Prophet, and you see the uh, names on the slide here, one of the earliest Muslims and Muhammad's father-in-law. He died after two years having appointed Omar, another of the Prophet's prominent companions, as his successor. Omar died 10 years later, having appointed a council of six to select the next caliph, and the council chose Uthman. Uthman ruled for 13 years, and when he died, Muslims swore allegiance to Ali as the next caliph. And these four together came to be revered among Sunnis as the rightly guided or Rashidun caliphs. According to the Shia, though, Ali was the only rightful caliph, and the first three were usurpers. And this is probably the biggest point of contention and the biggest point of tension among Sunni and Shia. The Shia believe that Ali appointed his son Hassan in his place, and after him his son, Hassan's brother, Hussein, both of whom were grandsons of the Prophet through the Prophet, Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad's uh, daughter, Fatima's marriage to Ali. So they were Prophet Muhammad's grandsons through Fatima. Uh, and after Hussein, the Shia believe, the succession continued in Hussein's line, father to son. Now, that's the early history of the Shia Sunni split. And I'm going to go on to doctrines which developed and were codified over time. There are theological, ritual, and legal differences, and I'll talk about these in a minute. But the fundamental difference between Sunni and Shia is the identity of the supreme leader, one. And also, and this is something many people don't realize, it's also in the nature of this leadership. So the identity and the nature of the leader and the leadership. This is, a, as you can imagine, it's a very complex topic. I'm going to give you just the bare bones version here. So a key word for this discussion is embodied in the word imam. In its more mundane use among both Sunni and Shia, it refers to an individual who leads the ritual prayer. But in its meaning of leadership of the community of Muslims, the supreme leadership of the community of Muslims, um, or a, a, in a larger um, uh, form um, of leadership beyond the local community, the word imam signifies different things. For Sunnis, it refers to any major, major religious authority, including but not limited to supreme leaders. For Shia, it refers to the Prophet Muhammad's designated des descendants. There's one imam in every age. He's the divinely appointed guide for humankind. He's infallible, uh, like the prophet, and allegiance to him, love for him, and obedience to him are mandatory. 
In the creed of faith, testifying to God's oneness and Muhammad's messengership, Shia add the line, I testify that Ali is God's chosen one. Ashadu anna aliyan waliullah. They further believe that Ali and every Imam after him possess certain knowledge acquired through divine inspiration and temporal training. He's the speaking Quran, for he receives inspiration from God. His interpretation of the Quran is the only true interpretation. And love for the Prophet and the family of the Prophet is a fundamental part of Shi'i religiosity, and also, by the way, of um, the religiosity of both Sunni Sufis. The Shia are divided further into denominations according to the lines of Imams they accept as legitimate, the largest being the Twelvers, Zaydis, and Ismailis. Twelvers and Ismailis believe the predecessor Imam appoints a successor by divine inspiration. Zaydis believe that any male descendant of Ali and Fatima, if he's learned and draws his sword to establish the truth, is the Imam. Um, also, across time, small great groups proclaimed divinity of Muhammad Ali or various Imams, and they have been termed exaggerators, but these have historically been a small minority. Today, Twelver Shiism, the largest Shi'i sect, represents the overwhelming majority in Iran. And if you could move on to the next slide, please. Yes. Um, Twelvers. Shiism was, Twelver Shiism was pro promoted in Iran in, uh, through the 16th through the 18th centuries by the Safavid Shahs, and today Twelvers are also the majority in Iraq, Lebanon, and Bahrain, and significant minorities are found in Syria, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Azerbaijan, and India. Zaydis were important in the 9th to 11th centuries in Iraq and northern Iran, and they're confined to Yemen. Um, Ismailis, also called Fatimids, controlled Egypt and much of the Eastern Mediterranean between the 10th and 12th centuries, and they dispersed after the end of the Fatimid Caliphate. Small communities remain in Syria and Iran, but the bulk are now in India with smaller numbers in Pakistan, Tajikistan, Yemen, and in diaspora. Uh, the Twelvers now believe that the 12th Imam went into metaphysical occultation in the 9th century, and he will appear as the Messiah, the Mahdi, at the end of time. In his absence, the community is guided by jurists, known as ayatullahs, or God's signs, who interpret the Quran, the Prophet's hadith, and the words and actions of the Imam. And believers today choose a living ayatullah to follow. The Ismailis today have two main subdivisions, Nizaris and Tayyibis. Nizaris believe their current Imam, who's also known as the Aga Khan, is in Muhammad's line. Tayyibis believe that the 21st Imam, whose name was at Tayyib, went into physical concealment, and the imamate continues in his line, in concealment, father to son. And he's represented among the people by an unbroken chain of leaders called Da'i, each appointed by his predecessor, who's spiritually guided by the imam and who guides the community. The Zaydis today currently do not have an imam, and they consider the situation doctrinally uh, possible. Among Sunnis, supreme leadership of the community has historically meant different things. But it has usually included both temporal and spiritual authority of some kind, though not in the same degree as the Shia version. Sunnis usually use the term caliphate rather than imamate, although they sometimes use the two words interchangeably. And the Shia also use the term caliphate, so it's not mutually exclusive. Um, according to Sunnis, the caliph must be from the Prophet's tribe of Quraysh. Therefore, rightly guided caliphs were from Quraysh, as were the Umayyad and Abbasid dynasties who ruled the Muslim empire for several centuries. The caliphate, they say, is a necessary institution, but the caliph, unlike the Prophet, is fallible and can be nominated in a variety of ways, including appointment by predecessor, election by a council, or nomination by an individual or individuals. Early on among proto-Sunnis, there were groups who rejected the caliphates of Uthman or Ali, but eventually all four early caliphs were canonized. After the end of the Ottoman Turkish caliphate in the early 20th century, there is no accepted caliph among the majority. And the Sunnis now take their name from the word sunna that we have heard about, or the practice of the prophet. The term developed gradually until from the late 8th century, it was commonly applied to this interpretation of Islam. A catalyst to the formation of formal Sunnism was the rise to fame of a jurist named Ibn Hanbal, 
who championed the Prophet's practice or sunnah to promote a literalist vision of Islamic law. It's also argued that Sunnism arose as a defined denomination in response to the crystallization of Shi'i doctrines. I'm following on now from differences in the concept of leadership and the views of particular leaders. Other aspects of Islam also diverge in terms of law. All schools, Sunni and Shi'i, look to the Quran and the Prophet's practice as primary sources of guidance, but they diverge in the specifics of interpretation and in the method of interpretation also. So some are literalist and lean toward the letter of the law. Others are rationalist and privilege the spirit of the law. Over time, several legal schools have emerged with their own founders and texts and approaches. Among the Sunnis, there are four major schools of law today, Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, and Shafi'i, and there are differences between and also within law schools or legal schools regarding, for example, women's rights and criminal laws and ideas of jihad and so on. Dietary laws also are mostly similar, but here, here too there are differences. So no pork and no alcohol for all Muslims, most Muslims, but what about coffee? <laughs> Uh, legal schools initially differed on this one, um, and in fact, the word qahwa, which many of you know scholars of Islam also actually don't necessarily know, is used in pre-Islamic poetry to mean wine. I mean, there are other names for wine, but qahwa meant wine, and it was used for this word because they weren't sure what it did to the mind. Eventually, people, you know, most schools coalesced around the idea that it was okay, it was legal, it wasn't. Uh, thank you, and it wasn't. Uh, altering of rationality in the way that uh, that wine was. Okay, so within Sunnism, most people self-identify through their legal school. Among the Shia, identity is based rather on the line of imam um, or imams a group follows, um, and each line has their own legal school. Theology. There are various understandings of the creator. Most Sunnis today understand God to have a physical form with hands and a face, for example, as described literally by the Quran, but quoting a term without asking how, bila kaif. It's a technical phrase coined by the 10th century theologian Al-Ash'ari. Twelver Shia follow an earlier rational school of theology, rationalist school of theology, and conceive of God as spirit. Ismaili Shia believe the creator is neither body nor spirit, but is, but is transcendent, the creator of both body and spirit, and simply beyond human imagination. Um, other contested theological issues include free will versus predestiny, the origin of the Quran. Also, what constitutes faith? Different answers are given by different Muslim groups, and they mention acknowledgement by the tongue, belief in the heart, acts by the body, and so on. For most Muslims, though, uh, these theological issues uh, are issues they don't really delve into that much. The Shia also share with Sunnis the main holy days of the Islamic calendar, which are called Eid. Eid al-Adha coincides with the culmination of the annual pilgrimage rites in Mecca, Eid al-Fitr after Ramadan, and Eid al-Milad, the Prophet's birthday, which was just celebrated yesterday and today, uh, and Mubarak uh, to all Muslims in the audience uh, for this auspicious day. Uh, distinctly Shi'i holy days include Ashura, remembering the martyrdom of the Prophet's grandson Hussein, and Ghadir, which celebrates Muhammad's appointment of Ali. Pilgrimages to tombs of venerated individuals is important among Shia and Sunnis, and most Sunnis. Um, in my presentation so far, I've spoken about points of unity and divergence among the Sunni and Shia denominations of Islam. And before I end, I want to say a few words on what I believe is an important related question, that of tolerance versus conflict between Muslim denominations and between Muslims and people of other faiths. So. Here are some frequently cited Islamic texts on the slide that promote respect and caring for others. The Quran says there is no compulsion in religion. La ikraha fid din. Elsewhere, the Quran says, and this is the verse used in the write-up describing our panel and that Professor Ray read out, we have created you male and female and appointed you races and tribes that you may know one another. The most honored among you in the eyes of God is the one who is most pious. 
the Prophet Muhammad said, all humans are children of God, and God loves best those who most help his children. Al-Khalqu Iyalullah. Wa ahabbu nasi lallahi anfa'uhum li'iyalihi. Um, I've written about Imam Ali's conception of justice and his pluralist vision in detail in a forthcoming article, and I'll give you just one example of what he says. Ali enjoins his governor in Egypt, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, to treat all his subjects, Sunni, Shi'i, Jew, and Christian, with fairness for, and I quote, they are either your brothers in faith, they are either your brothers in faith, or your peers in humanity. These are the teachings of Islam, but the reality on the ground has been checkered. Under Muslim rule, through history, there have been times of persecution and also times of collaboration. Radically intolerant ideology was seen among the Kharijites or seceders in the first century of Islam, who branded any Muslims who disregarded or disagreed with their interpretation of, his, of Islam as heretics, and they attacked and pillaged and killed. And we see their heirs today among fringe groups like ISIS. In contrast, we see beautiful periods of harmony that can serve as exemplars for Muslims and indeed for all people. The medieval Fatimid Shia dynasty who ruled Egypt are by and large a model of inclusivist and tolerant governance for Sunni and Shi'i, Christian and Jew. Similarly, the Sunni rulers of Spain promoted by and large a space of harmonious coexistence among Muslims, Jews, and Christians. I want to end on a personal note. I'm Muslim, and I believe it's vitally important for Muslims to emulate exemplars of peace and to reject promoters of intolerance. We each have our own strong beliefs and convictions, and that's as it should be. Else, what does it mean to have conviction and belief? But we must respect the choices of others. And we must build on our points of unity rather than squabble over our points of difference. This is what my late revered father, Sayyid Nakhuzayma Qutbuddin, has taught me. And I serve as one of the directors of the Taqrib Academic Organization for Communal Harmony that he founded in India. Taqrib is an Arabic word which means to bring people closer. I also believe that it's equally important for non-Muslims to understand the ethical and spiritual bedrock of the scriptures of Islam and to recognize the diversity and beauty of Muslim cultures and communities. Each one of you, each one of us, can make a difference. So use your talents, use your skills, use, you know, reach out to whoever you can to promote understanding, respect, love, compassion, harmony. Yeah. This conference, I think, has taken an excellent step in that direction. Thank you for your attention.